when the word witch is bandied about, there are many different ideas and images that are conjured. Mm -hmm. And when you were, let's say, 1691, 1692, and you're in the colonies, the image of a witch is a specific thing. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about that? In 1692, the legal definition of someone who had a familiar spirit and it was assumed you knew what that meant. But they were in cahoots with an evil spirit, a little de de demon or imp. And in order to do that, you're in, at some point been in contact with the devil, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, because it was understood by you know, the ministers that humans did not have the ability to perform magic. Therefore, if there is magic being done, it's not being done by the person, but by some spirit that they're in contact with. Now, folklore would say that there's good spirits who will do that too, but the ministers would tell you the angels have better things to do than that. So it has to be an evil spirit and Satan's behind that. Some people did practice a lot of folk magic, maybe more in England because they weren't all Puritans. Well, they weren't all Puritans here either, but... Uh, there were white witches or blessing witches, so called, meaning they only did the they did only the good magic. But if you have the idea that the source of it is really only pretending to do good for a while until you're really thoroughly caught in their clutches, it's not something you should be fooling around with. So where does counter magic come into this? Ah, uh, well, that's part of folklore. It's something to repel the evil magic that comes at you. Theoretically, allegedly, uh, it's supposed to dispel it, counteract it, uh, bounce it back to the person who is casting it in the first place, which is what the witch cake jam was supposed to do. Can you tell me about the witch cake? Yeah, it was English folklore, and it was suggested to Tichuba and John Indian by a neighbor, Mary Sibley, who's an English woman, uh, well, her parents were anyway, and she's a member of the church, I believe, so she considered her, considers herself a good Christian. But this this current of folklore that's just common, and this is, you know, this is repelling evil magic, so it can't be harmful is the idea. But it got the girls more worried, so the outcome was not good. But the idea of magical spells, some part of the witch's being is projected out to hurt the victim. So if you take part of the victim, and in this case it could be a lock of hair maybe, or in this case some of the girl's urine, easily taken from them. You don't have to cut off an ear like they might do with livestock. <laughs> but uh, that is tortured, you might say, by being baked into a little rough cake of the cheapest flour you've got. <laughs> and you feed it to the dog once it's cooked. And the dog crunches it up and digests it, and that would should hurt the witch because the part of the perpetrator that's in the urine that's in the charm is being acted on, and the pain, I guess, is supposed to bounce back to whoever sent it. But that would make them come around and say, what's going on, or begging for relief. Well, that doesn't happen. But the girls get more upset because now... As far as I can see it, now the adults are really assuming there could be magic here, which the doctors already said, the physician, go to the medical professionals. And one of them thought it might be bewitchment. So it, the, the adults are taking that seriously. Interestingly, the Parises didn't immediately go to that as a, so, a solution to the girls' symptoms, whatever they were. It is very interesting that the physicians are the ones who end up diagnosing mm some form of witchcraft taking place. Well, the fact that, or the assumed fact that magic was a possibility was just there in the culture and in the other cultures. It wasn't just a Puritan thing. It was England, Europe, and Africa, the Native Americans, everywhere, really. But because of the trials and and tensions of the times, economy, war, and all that. People were on edge to begin with, along with the local quarrels. So it seemed like the last straw. They are under siege by real, actual, in-this-world problems. 
And this seems like one more thing that could happen. So two of your works that we're really looking into, the Mm -hmm. Day by Day Chronicle and Six Women of Salem, um, we really want to focus first on these six women. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can give me kind of like a paragraph or two in your mind, just how you would describe each of these women as a way to maybe set them up in the show later. Okay. So is it okay if I go down the list and you you just, okay. So let's start with Bridget Bishop. Hmm. Uh, Bridget Bishop was married, so she's not alone in the world. This is her third husband. She's been suspected before, however, of witchcraft, but she has survived that. There's not as much paperwork on it as you'd like surviving. Uh, She was confrontational, some of the neighbors thought. I'd say she stuck up for herself. This, she's, this is the, her third husband. The second husband would hit her now and then, but she hit him back. How about Mary English? Mary English was the richest woman in Salem. Her father had been a, a merchant who was lost at sea, and she married his business partner, Philip English, who was from the Isle of Jersey and had more of a French culture. His name was Philippe Langlois, something like that that I'm mispronouncing. So they're very rich. Some people, at least according to descendants, thought she put on airs. But, you know, class and status and the responsibilities of class were bigger in the, big in those days, not like now. <laughs> but uh, she was accused even though she was a full member of the Salem Church in town. Let's uh, continue with Rebecca Nurse. Mm. Rebecca Nurse was uh, older than middle age. She had a large family of grown children with grandchildren, so it's an extant family. There's not a lot of death in infancy in her family. Uh, Her husband is still alive, so she's not a widow pretty much on her own. She has a good support network, and she's in full member of the Salem Town Church. She seems to be well-respected, but she's accused, and some people just didn't get along with her, I guess. I think a lot of personality conflicts in this, but even though she had a family who rallied around her all through it, even though it might have been dangerous to speak up at times, she doesn't survive. And Ann Putnam? Uh, Ann Putnam is an accuser. She's married to Thomas Putnam, who also helps to accuse people. And their eldest child is Anne Jr., who's one of the afflicted girls near the beginning. She seems to have not liked Rebecca Nurse. She's quite, I think she's self-convinced that there are witches after her. Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey seem to be particular problems with her. And she actually has convulsions too in the courtroom, in the early stages, but she's also expecting like her sixth or eighth child, so there could have been some physical symptoms that were then misinterpreted. But she seems to be quite convinced of the neighbor's guilt. Uh, how about Tituba? Uh, Tituba, called Tituba Indian. She's always referred to by her contemporaries as an Indian rather than an African. She belongs with her husband uh, to Reverend Samuel Paris. She's from somewhere else, presumably Barbados, where Paris had been a merchant before becoming a minister and moving to New England. So she's accused early on. She makes the witch cake at the direction of a neighbor with an English bit of folklore, although there's probably worldwide equivalents of this. But that's the only magic she can really be connected to. But because she's enslaved, she has even less of a support group than anybody else, and she's more or less bullied into agreeing with what the magistrates are saying, even though she's trying to say she's a victim of witches. They're convinced she's one of them, and at that point she'll say anything, I think, to survive. It's all she has, really, to protect her, and she will outlive the panic because they're reserving her as a witness against the others, although I don't think she does have to speak in court because plenty of other people were doing that. And finally, Mary Warren. Uh, Mary Warren is about 17 or 19, a hired girl. She's working for the John and Elizabeth Proctor family. Uh, apparently, her mother and her mother died fairly recently. It might, might have been smallpox. They mentioned a fever, and there had been smallpox. And a, her little sister went deaf from it but survived. It's not certain 
who, uh, which Warren, her father, was because there's like three or four families in the area and they're all fairly obscure. Uh, but she has a lot to say during the trials. And she thinks at first she's afflicted or acts that way. When her her employer, master, proctor is out of town, she she's having fits and accuses people and acts in court as a witness. And when he comes home, he... He, wh- he whips her a bit, which one could do within reason to a servant. It's called correcting them. And she changes her mind. But when she changes her mind, she's accused of selling out by the other still afflicted witnesses. And after that, she'll say anything to survive. So we really want to talk about how the different social strata of mm-hmm. the women, where they existed in, in those places, uh, how it affected the way they were treated mm-hmm. once once the trials started to come around, and they were all involved in the trials in different ways. Um, but how did the social strata mm. really affect them all? Well, your place in society was a lot more rigid then than now. Some people did go up in the world, and of course there'd be some resentment from people who hadn't. Uh, there's a quote somewhere about you were, you, you excuse me, you may be Mrs. So-and-so now, but you only good wife somebody before this. You know, they were obviously not taking it well. Uh, let's see. Some of the upper crust people who were named, were uh, the ac- those accusations tended to be dismissed by some of the magistrates who knew the people and knew that they would never do that, which of course they hadn't, but it did help. On the other hand, just being well off wasn't enough because Mary English was certainly arrested. Also, some of the really poor ones like Sarah Good, she was had come down in the world, actually, and uh, she was cranky because of it, and crankiness didn't help. But then I got the impression from what's recorded that Rebecca Nurse was polite enough all through and didn't help her. Let's talk about the Putnam's relationship to the Proctors and anything about the towns, like those three groups. Um, the the extended town family had woodlots in Topsfield where they lived, mm-hmm. and the extended Putnam family had woodlots in the same area. But there were different surveys involved and boundary lines that were not accurate, which wasn't exactly their fault, but each one was going to keep the one that was more beneficial to them. So there were some court cases where there'd been fights or near fights in the woods when guys went out to collect firewood or timber. I think the whole town of Topsville's border was contended by Salem Village because of those boundary disputes. So there was some bad feeling there. A a lot of it probably just didn't get written down. People who just rubbed each other the wrong way. There's a lot of documentation surviving, but not enough. (laughs) Not when you're a fanatic about it. How did the Putnams like really figure into that? Because the Putnams are the ones who are having the dispute a lot of the times. Mm. Yes, well, it's, it's a big family. Um, and Thomas Putnam his, and his wife and his daughter are some of the major accusers. They're willing to suspect, I guess, at least anybody, a lot of people in the neighborhood. And also, he wrote a very good hand, clear hand, so that he took a lot of the notes and depositions. So he was quite busy with it as a civic duty. <laughs> and... He did not want to just blend into the background. He wanted to be a civic leader, I believe. And this was unfortunately his big chance. So it seemed to be very important to prove whether or not the girls were actually possessed Mm. in some way or if they were under the spell or, or under the influence of a witch. Why was that so important? I suppose if you were possessed by demons... It could be involuntary, but you could be collaborating with them, too. And then that would make you, in effect, a witch. But if you're just a poor victim of somebody else, some other human's malice, although their pet demons are supposedly causing the pains, are you a victim or are you collaborating was the question. What was it about the convulsions themselves that made everyone just so feel so uneasy? Well, a convulsion is a scary thing to see. (laughs) 
um, let's see, Reverend Hale at one point in he, in the book he wrote later, he said it was beyond the power of epilepsy what they were going through. And they must have seen epileptic seizures and certainly there seemed to be a lot of fevers when they got too high, people would convulse, and they knew what that meant. But there was something really different about this or more extreme prior to this and prior to the Goodwin case somewhat earlier, convulsions I don't think were common as a symptom. It would be the cow died or the cow went dry or the livestock died or all sorts of misfortunes, but it wasn't so much that people seemed to be repelling an attack of an invisible entity. So this was not, well, witch trials were not an everyday occurrence even then, but it was, uh, the convulsions were particularly distressing part of this. Although why they were believed and not, uh, again, Hales, uh, to paraphrase him, he kind of said you had to be there. It was yeah. just really bad. Well, it kind of leads to why perhaps these younger women, uh, at least early on, why their stories were believed over adults. Yeah, because children and young women and older women, depending on who is asking the questions, uh, they, their testimony didn't bear carry as much weight to, in the judges' minds necessarily, although women did speak in court as witnesses. Uh, but, you know, a child's testimony, do they know what they're talking about? But there must have been just something about it that does not translate in the notes, even when they're pretty, seem to be pretty thorough. And, I mean, you read the questions and answers for the hearings. They're not the trial questions. It's the hearing that leads up to it. And it's like something with the sound turned off. You're not really hearing somebody screaming in agony or protesting or the audience reacting. It sounds not conducive to clear thinking. We mentioned Sarah Good, I mm -hmm. think, earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and Sarah Osborne. Women of that standing, what, mm -hmm. how do you think they were treated by their, their, the people who lived around them? Well, as I said, uh, Sarah Good had come down in the world. She came from a better-off family, but stepfather kind of got things that you know, should have gone to the children. And then she's married to an impecunious person who then dies and leaves her in debt. And she marries second husband, who is no great provider at all. And she's begging from time to time for her children. So this. She can be kind of annoying with Sarah Good come around again wanting something. And the fact that she's, she feels this keenly and is cranky, not really, not a humble person. So she can get on people's nerves. Uh, perhaps coming down in the world might seem like you're, you're just not trying hard enough, although how hard can a woman try and actually get something in those days economically? How many opportunities are there? Uh, or if, I don't know, it's some punishment from God, which is rather unfair to put on God. <laughs> but, you know, they're not, it's not orthodox necessarily, but the neighbors might wonder. Uh, Sarah Osborne, was, well, she had, she and her husband had a farm, but the first husband dies, and she marries the bond servant. And the farm should have gone to the sons when they came of age, and she still has rights to live there, at least while she's a widow. But now she's married, and there's a second husband, and he's kind of taking over the running of things, and the sons cannot get the farm, now that they're of age, away from him. So there's a lot of hard feelings with that, and the Putnams were related to the first husband. So that kind of explains a few things. You know, maybe for the benefit of our listeners, it might be good to just go over the basics of like what the rights of women were in 17th century New England. Hmm. Well, they did say about class, this, the better sort came right out and said the better sort, middling sort, and the lower sort. And uh, how people were addressed is reflected in this. M Mr. and Mrs. is master and mistress. They obviously employ people. Uh, people like Rebecca Nurse in the middle, it would be good wife nurse, hence goody nurse. It's not a nickname. It's like Mrs. only abbreviated. Good man and good wife. And then people below that, 
are just addressed by their first name, the way people address each other now. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Someone was asked how she had addressed Sarah Good or her specter. And she said, well, I guess I just called her Sarah. She didn't have to be good wife Sarah because they didn't own anything. And below that, she's at least free, although she's married, uh, there's servants who are contracted for a length of time, and then there's people who are owned in slavery and can be bought and sold. Unfortunately, slavery is legal in Massachusetts. Although there's not a lot of them, they are around, Indians and Africans. But uh, women, they did have rights. Uh, some of them brought court cases. Some sued for divorce, which was very difficult in England. I don't I think the only way you could get a real divorce is to, was to go through Parliament, so that's just the upper escalon, and I don't think they could remarry legally. I'm not certain at this time. But in Massachusetts, the Puritans, you could get a divorce and remarry, and it would all be legal. Children would be legal, inheritances would be legal. And there were women who sued their husbands and got divorces. <laughs> Didn't happen every day, but they did. <laughs> but uh, a married woman not just among Puritans, but in England too, were uh, covered by their husband. He was the head of the household. He was the spokesman. He was supposed to be running things so that she technically did not own anything unless she was a widow who had had a good prenuptial contract, and some of those still exist. But if you don't own anything, there's not a lot to contract, which is why when there were confiscations for, like, jail debts and stuff, uh, Dorcas Hall, who was a widow at the time, they took some of her furniture and the cow and so on because she owed money. But when Bridget Bishop was arrested... And she hangs. No, they didn't confiscate anything because she didn't own anything. Her husband did, even though she had owned a few things before she was married. Now it was absorbed into his. Oh. But they could they could speak up, and and they could most hmm, perhaps most importantly to them, women like men was supposed to. You know, search your soul to see if you were saved or were you worthy of joining the church and having communion and access to baptism and so on. And that was a personal journey so that they would be members of the church equal before God. Couldn't vote, <laughs> but in church matters, but they sometimes made their feelings, made their feelings known, but yeah. But at least before God, you were equal. So let's jump to power. Okay. Power within the society, because I feel like all this is very much connected. Mm. Um, the power seemed to find its roots in faith. Even though we, you mentioned these this, these are not all Puritans mm -hmm. who are, that we're talking about. Um, however, that Puritan faith and that Puritan power structure kind of had its hold over everything. Hmm. When people emigrated early on, like the 1630s, a lot of people coming in, most of them are coming over for faith reasons. But it soon became evident that they didn't all believe the same thing exactly. So in order to vote, which is men, it, uh, you're supposed to, they were supposed to be members, fully communing members of one of the churches, which is, they're all separate entities. There isn't, like, bishops or anything, it's to show that uh, you know, these are upstanding citizens and they're not going to rob you or something like that. But uh, eventually other people moved in, uh, Quakers and locals who converted to Quakerism. Also, uh, Church of England families, um, the men who were merchants, who, a lot of them who came in later were Church of England. And, of course, this, in, back in England, there's the civil wars going on, and the Puritans predominate during the Commonwealth period when there's no king, although there are other groups. When the king returns, when Charles II comes back and the monarchy is reestablished, the Church of England is 
definitely Episcopalian at this point, and in England, nonconformists, as all of the different sects of Puritanism are called, are excluded from the university degrees, couldn't run for parliament, and so forth. And so uh, Massachusetts tried to pretend that the, they just couldn't find the paperwork to get rid of the charter and all that. But eventually, they had to allow, they had to not allow the requirement that you be a church member in order to vote. But England changes it, so you have to own a certain amount of property. So theoretically, some poorer church members maybe don't vote anymore. On the local level, if you're going to choose the hog reef and the cow catcher in town and the guy to mend the roads, they may not care about that and selectmen. But the upper ranks of the government, you had to have a certain amount of property. So are you going to, is it a, a religious requirement or a financial requirement? Yeah, how connected are those two things? You know, well, I mean, there were Episcopalians <laughs> who had money too. <laughs> mm-hmm. So let's let's pull back and talk about uh, just citizens of Essex County, people mm-hmm. who were living in es- Essex County at the time, right up into and then un- as the the trials are occurring. How are these trials that are happening? Let's just say wherever the epicenter is, like mm-hmm. around Salemish. Salemish. <laughs> what? How is the rest of Essex County being affected? Just in their daily going about their lives. Ah, well, when the panic started and and the law got into it, got involved in this, there's hearings and arrests. But it's Salem. It Salem includes Salem Village, which is the rural end of town. But the panic is spreading, and in the summer, Andover, which then bordered it, uh, began to have cases, and there were actually more people accused in Andover than in Salem. So the panic spread, and the people in Ipswich and Gloucester and in some of the Middlesex County towns, so that there were jails in three counties involved in this. But each of them are neighborhood quarrels, family quarrels. That's one of the most fascinating things about this in, entire crisis is that these are essentially neighborhood quarrels mm. in between neighbors. But there's this spiritual aspect to them that that brings in this uh, the weight and the power of something otherworldly. Um, the so effects if- seem to be magic and that involves spirits of one kind or another. <laughs> Um, Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. But but simultaneously, you have nature bearing down mm-hmm. on all of these humans. Because as you're getting in closer and closer to winter, uh, at the time, there's a real physical danger that's approaching as well. Oh, the people in jail. Were, it, jails were not conducive to your health. <laughs> they apparently had fireplaces because there's bills for firewood. But uh, they're not meant to hold people for a long time length of time, and they're not supposed to hold a lot of people. Once winter started to come down, on the temperatures getting colder, which happened earlier than it does now, uh, there were petitions, some of them from Andover anyway, asking if the, the suspects could be let out until spring. We promise we'll bring them back when the trials resume next. I, a few people were let out on bail. Some of the youngest ones, even though they'd been accusing people, they went home. But I don't think many of the older ones did. And some of the children that got arrested, they did go home, but not all of them. And that's one reason the trials resumed the following January. They're waiting to hear from the Crown, should, are we proceeding right? Should we do this? Uh, but it was just, it was too dangerous for the people in jail. And just, even if the temperature was good, it's not clean with all those people in one place. (laughs) How linked are the concepts of sin and crime? Oh, not every sin is a crime, but all crimes involve some kind of sin. Uh, Drunkenness would be sinful, but if you're not 
If a guy is drunk but he doesn't waste the family substance, beat the wife and the children, then it's not a crime, <laughs> but it's sinful. Why was confession such an important part of the trials themselves? Well, any, any capital conviction required either two competent witnesses to the same act, that's where spectral evidence gets tangled up, or a credible confession from the accused. And they were aware, and they say at length, that it's not somebody whose mind is affected or they're tortured into it or anything like that. But so, the people who did confess, and there were a lot of people who did confess, uh, some of them said afterwards that they really didn't know what they had said. They were so terrified by what was going on. So one woman said she remembers a document being read in the name of the king and the queen, and after that she didn't know what happened. She just couldn't remember it. She blanked out. And others would probably, they was, it sounded like they was just agreeing to anything in order to get on the good side of the magistrate or, or in the hopes that it would lengthen their life because the people who were, who had confessed and uh, were held as witnesses against the supposed co uh, collaborators. And that delayed things so that not all of them, but most of them survived because the panic died down until spectral evidence, which is the report of what the demons are doing, was no longer allowed in court. Describe some of those, uh, I guess, the evolution of criticisms against spectral evidence. Mm. Well, at the very beginning, uh, one of the judges who lived in Boston consulted with his pastors, Cotton Mather, about <laughs> any information on how he should proceed. And Matha said to be very careful of spectral evidence. It really can't be trusted. I mean, it's axiomatic. The devil is the prince of lies. He's a liar. You can't believe anything that comes from that direction. So you can't really believe it. And they said they'd be careful, but they weren't careful. And I think Matha, who wasn't there at most of the trials, uh, just assumed that they're older than I am. They, they, they're wise enough people. They probably know what they're doing which they didn't really because they were carried away by it all too. It seemed so real at the time, unfortunately, because the convulsions in the courtroom seemed to be the crime being committed right in front of everybody, and we can all see the effects of it. But the cause of it, they could not see, and they had to depend on the reports of the supposed afflicted. And even if the afflicted people were quite, convinced themselves they can be deluded by the devil. And that's their own philosophical outlook on it, and they didn't pay enough attention to it. It's pointed out on the very first day by Sarah Osborne that the devil can take the shape of anybody, so why not me? For some reason, it was said afterwards anyway, that for some reason Stoughton thought that you did have to give the devil permission, as if the prince of lies is going to ask you permission. It really didn't make sense. So he, he seemed to think he knew what he was doing, and he was a very strong personality. And I think that if some of the other judges had second thoughts, they maybe figured he knew what he was talking about. Although, after the first execution of Bridget Bishop, one of the judges, Nathaniel Salt and Stahl, stepped down. He just left. Speaking of, um, Bridget Bishop wasn't the first person to get arrested right. for these crimes, but she was the first person to put, be put on trial. What yes. was the reasoning for that? Uh, Bridget Bishop had been suspected before of witchcraft, so there was that against her. There maybe seemed more evidence against her, or at least her reputation wasn't good in that respect, although that's really other people's reactions than anything she had actually done. She was sort of the usual suspect, you might say. Why was Tituba's testimony in particular, why was it powerful? When she started describing things and sort of to fulfill the expectation of the questioners, it was a pretty vivid story about this spirit and that spirit and these invisible, otherwise invisible entities and the, some in the shape of birds and this hairy thing that was standing by the fire. 
warming its hands or pinching the girls and a bird with a woman's head. It was pretty colorful. It was probably more thorough than that, than the notes indicated, because there's a lot going on. And they are using shorthand, but it's still not an absolute transcription. So that was pretty vivid. And she describes other witch specters, Osborne and Good, but then others also, but she doesn't know who they were. So people are left with wondering, who are the others and who do I not trust who might be a suspect? And then it really blew out of, out of control. So almost that known unknown that there are others out there. We just don't know who they are. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, but because they could be under attack from them next, the way they could be under attack from the French and Indian forces in the on the frontier and coming closer to, which was a very real threat. Uh, later on, they get as close as Andover, but yeah, it seemed like it was all too likely to happen. Even something of like just the wilderness, the wildlife that surrounded them, because... There were wolves around still, and there's a spectral wolf, presumably spectral wolf, reported that chases the doctor's hired girl, and she has conniptions and fits soon after. But there were bounties on wolves, which I, I'm on the side of the wolves now, but... Uh, but there were bounties paid at least the year before, so I think they're in the vicinity, and it's winter. So, yeah, that would make people nervous, too. Fear really is just one of the most pervasive things. Fear is very powerful, and it still is. And if you get to the point where you're panicking, then you're not you're thinking even less clearly than otherwise. What are the main separations between the role of someone who's a servant and someone who is a slave? Well, you don't sell the servant. It's uh, They're contracted for a certain period of time, but a slave is enslaved for life. There were cases of um, enterprising sea captains kidnapping people on the coast of England and Ireland and bringing them over as bond servants against their will, and they had a certain period of time to work out. And there was a, a lawsuit by a couple, and they might have been brothers, who had been kidnapped like that and thought that they, their time should be up by now, so we should be free. And they're saying that their master was a bit too hard and wasn't going to let them go. I think they got out. So, But even, even though this was totally involuntary, there was a time limit on it. The new colonial charter, what did it promise to the colonists? Uh, the new charter, which took years to negotiate, uh, made the, their government legal. But one thing that England says in it is that it cannot be repugnant to any of the laws of England, the repugnancy clause. <laughs> it can't contradict English common law, which isn't written down, but apparently there's ways of finding out what it is. Um, some parts of Massachusetts law did differ. I, hmm like the divorce thing, but I'm not sure if they even looked at that. Uh, what the, There were various agents of the government prowling around making sure that if there were violations or not, but they seemed to be mostly interested in import-export taxes that were not being paid. They didn't seem to mention the witchcraft problem at all <laughs> until one of them got beaten up and put in jail. <laughs> in the even talk side dispute, and he didn't like being in jail with a lot of commoners, burglars, Negroes, and witches, he said. So he did not really care what they were doing with the witch trials. But um, witchcraft was illegal in both countries, and when Phipps suspended the trials in the fall, in October, and asked for England's advice, when it came back, it said, just do what the law allows and do your best. They didn't seem to quibble over how it had gone. Speaking of uh, Phipps and mm -hmm. ending the trials, what do we know about Lady Mary Phipps? Oh, well, she was well-educated. She's from Maine, too. I guess her family was in Maine and in Massachusetts. It was said that she taught her husband how to read 
on their honeymoon or soon after. He, but even though he couldn't read, he was able to oversee building a ship and keep all that in his head. So he had a good memory anyway. But um, she was apparently, you know, a, a, a force, a forceful woman, and he, and he was devoted to her, listened to her. It said that she was accused, and apparently the source is a good one, that she was at least named, uh, that she had helped somebody get out of jail, signed their, a warrant to get them out. I, I thought for a while that, you know, William Phipps and Mary Phipps, William and Mary, the monarchs, that there was some confusion there, or maybe they pretended there was a confusion. But she may have done that because the source is Thomas Hutchinson, the mid-18th century governor of Massachusetts who wrote a history, and he said he was shown a paper by somebody who had been a jailer and got fired when they let them out unauthorized. But, uh, yeah, she could have been named. But nothing was done about it because at that point, Phipps decides this is not going the right way and realizes what Sarah Osborne pointed out the first day of the hearings. If somebody sees a specter that looks like you, it doesn't mean it's you. So that, that tactic did seem to work, paying, if you had the means, right. paying to be released. It, well, in a, bri- yeah, not pay, legally. bribing. Well, not everybody thought that the trial's proceeding the right way, but we don't know exactly. It could have been just, they were bribable. <laughs> It did help to have money, and if you were wealthy enough, like Philip and Mary English, they were put in the Boston jail, but then he had enough money and put up a bond, 4,000 pounds, which is huge, uh, that they could then rent a room in the jailer's house, which had, you know, better amenities. (laughs) It was a room rather than a common room with everybody in it. So it was easy to escape from that, too. I think he could go, the story with them is that they could go out and get some exercise as long as they paid for a guide to come with them. But that led to all sorts of possibilities. And there were people who didn't like the way the trials were going, such as Reverend Samuel Willard and Reverend, I think, Joshua Moody, who was in town also from New Hampshire. The, uh, par- the family story with the English is, is that they helped arrange things for them and persuade them to escape. But they did escape. They went to New York. I know there are several people who had to remain in jail even after their charges. Now they're debtors, trials. yes. Yeah. So how did, how did being a debtor function within the trials? Mm. Well, you had to pay the fees. It's like two shillings, six pence a week, I think. And that I've seen is what a woman, if she was working full time as spinning and weaving, could earn in a week. So that's that's a sizable amount of money. Uh, their families were supposed to come up with it, and one woman who died of natural causes in jail, the jailer wouldn't release the body to the sons until they p- paid her fees, the rent. <laughs> and then I guess th- they did, but they complained about it later when there were reparations. The family had to come up with it, and I think the Jacobs family had to borrow money in order to get the daughter out. And then the person who loaned it sued them for debt, and she was back. She didn't want to go back to jail again. It, it, was, it was financial difficulty. 1712, there was some restitution, and people applied to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts saying, this is what I spent and why, and some of them were reimbursed. Philip English asked for a great deal, but he was on good financial standing, so he didn't get that much. But, yeah, Massachusetts tried to make amends. It didn't bring, didn't bring back your dead grandmother, but it was something. But anyway, it gives us some paperwork to, to know what people had to spend. They'd put in... Uh, the expense of hiring a horse and going down to Boston from Salem, which is a whole day's trip, to tend to their mother or their aunt or somebody, bring them some fresh clothes and some decent food. I mean, I guess you got bread and water, but 
it wasn't great. And then they do that so many times in a week, and that's that's a lot of time away from work. It's the crops are growing or not growing. And yes, it, it was financially bad for Massachusetts as well as for the individuals. Who was the final accused witch to actually leave the jail? Mm, it's hard to say. I really don't know. Was... Um... Okay, was Tituba at least within the Salem witch trials? Was it was it Tituba the last person because of some of these? Uh, she may she was among the last, I would say, because her she didn't come before the juries trial juries until the following May of 90, 1693. and then there were her fees. She'd been in jail a long time, and Samuel Paris did not want her back. <laughs> because that whole episode is at this point very embarrassing, and what if she really is a witch? Do I want her in my house? So he wasn't going to pay it, and they've sold her to somebody we don't know to, to cover the fees. So she's back to being a slave somewhere else, and we don't know where. But apparently locally, because it's mentioned that she was. She was not sold out of the colony at that point. She just disappears <laughs> from the records. What are the kinds of like primary sources? Like, what's the kind of written stuff that you actually mm. have from 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 this time? Oh yeah. And what are the kinds of things they write about? There's a lot we don't know, but there's a lot of documentation that has survived. Um, there's warrants, uh, the complaint, the original complaints. A mitimus, where someone's being transferred from one jail to another. And they're not for everybody. It's not a complete set for everyone who's accused. But especially at the beginning, there's a lot of questions and answers taken down during the initial hearing, not at the trials, but at the hearings, to see if there's enough here to hold someone for trial. And surprise, nearly all of them were. <laughs> but uh, different people took notes at different times, and some are more complete than others. But you've got questions and answers, and you can see, for example, with Tituba, where a couple of people were taking notes on that first day. You can see whether the questioner was presumably John Hawthorne is already made up his mind, this has to be a guilty person, so he's he's going to keep asking the question until he gets an answer. And then she describes things and if you put the two together and you get this picture of all of the devils in the parsonage and what they look like and who else is in the suspicions and how somebody flew through the air and so on. And those are extremely helpful. <laughs> and then there are statements by witnesses and accusers who say on such and such a date I was afflicted and so on that's painful and it's on a date and maybe somebody else makes a statement saying yes they saw them convulsing on such and such a date but then there's other depositions where we I had an argument with someone and then the cow got sick or, and then there's the confessions that some people did and uh, they confessed that they sold themselves to the devil and how did he appear and he always was uh, came as a black dog or he looked like a man, or he looked like a, a cult, I think, in one case, or in how, and were you, and they describe being rebaptized into the devil's co communion, and they're thrown into, someone got thrown into a stream, they're coming up with what, whatever comes through their head, someone's face was pushed in a bucket of water, they said, or they wrote out a contract on a piece of birch bark, or they were illiterate and they put their thumb mark on something, the sun, they can get quite detailed, but you know, even though it didn't happen, it's extremely interesting. Uh, and then there are lists back in '93. You do get the names of some of the jurors. Unfortunately, most of the jurors in 1692, we don't know who they were because that paperwork didn't survive. And later on, there are petitions saying, "This is what I went through, and I want my name cleared." And the petitions for reimbursement later on in like 1712 after the reversal of attainder and the names have been cleared if they got in the petitions. There were five, I think, that didn't get cleared until 2001. 
on Halloween. They weren't taking this seriously. But, uh, you know, they, they're listing what they lost, what was confiscated, uh, the money they had to spend to go visit a relative in jail and so on. So there's a lot of detail. And a lot of those are online, which is very helpful on the University of Virginia's website. There was commentary at the time. Let's see. The, when the panic started to wind down in October, there were a couple of letters circulated, not in print at the time, they're in print now. Uh, one was by one of the Brattles, criticizing the way the trials had proceeded, uh, too much spectral evidence it boils down to. There's some anecdotes in that, but mostly it's an argument as to why this does not work. And Increase Mather, who had negotiated the charter, writes up his views that he'd had been discussed at a meeting of area ministers, uh, cases of conscience, it's a longer title than that, as to why you cannot trust spectral evidence. Let's see. And there are some letters, such as from Phipps to the Privy Council or the Crown of various government officials in England saying, it's not, I'm stopping it, it wasn't my fault, I wasn't there, I was following your orders to keep Maine safe. Uh, but we've stopped it now, and it wasn't my fault. <laughs> uh, but hmm. let's see. So when the tr uh, trials uh, start up again in January and so on, there's some paperwork from that. A cup, and in October, the court, I guess, the government, asked Cotton, rather, to write a summary of what had been going on. And he at this point, still assumes that they had been proceeding correctly, and maybe he's making too, thinks he needs to make more excuses for how things had gone, so it kind of supports the view that they had proceeded as best they could, and it did nothing for his reputation thereafter, and it kind of ties him with that, even though he did say at the beginning, you shouldn't really use spectral evidence. And he had a lot of other good things that he did, but that was a very unfortunate one. Although the book is a good source of what people were saying and of view, and views of the trials. And there's some anecdotes in it that aren't in the existing papers. They did send uh, the court, mm, clerk of the court, sent him some of the paperwork, which he got to see, and some of that might not exist now, but that's what he was writing from and making excuses for how the government had proceeded because another thing is that the government is trying to establish itself according to the new charter and they don't need so much public unrest that they lose it again or you know the populace does something to react against it and England says oh well forget about self-rule after this so he 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 was trying to protect the reputation of the government too much. As strange as it is, you can view the Salem crisis as a PR nightmare for a group of people. It was a PR nightmare, yes. <laughs> right. And, and because of that book, which was published in England and in New England, uh, Robert Kaff, who was a merchant, and he'd been a constable in Boston in that year, so he might have been helping to arrest people. We don't really know that. Uh, he was highly critical of the trials at this point. He hadn't really said anything while it was going on, but he wrote a book criticizing this, criticizing the Mathers and the government. And that has a lot, a lot of really good source material because he spoke to some of the families involved and and prints some of the paperwork that didn't get saved or it was a receipt from the sheriff as to what got confiscated. And we know about it because it was in his book. And then there was back and forth between the Mathers and Gaff and, and so on, debating how things had gone. But that is a source book. And later, Reverend John Hale, who had believed that it was witchcraft at first and then did change his mind, he wrote a book later as to how it seemed and how it is obviously not 
a good idea to accept spectral evidence, although at the time it seemed like such and such. And there's anecdotes in there that that were very helpful. But it wasn't published until after his death in 1700. But that's a good source, too. At the very top, we talked about Rebecca Nurse. She had, a, like you said, a support structure around her, her family. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about what made her family ready for this fight, because it wouldn't have been, it's not an easy thing to fight for mm-hmm. her name and f- for her innocence. Well, they just were going to protect mother. <laughs> the nurse family got statements from neighbors. They c- circulated a petition among neighbors, and lots of people signed it. It wasn't just them. So they people put their names on it, and there was never any retaliation against any of the people who did that or the petitions for the proctors or for Mary Bradbury, I'm happy to say. Uh, And they took that to the governor and other statements, and even a statement from, I believe this was at this point, a statement from the jurors who misunderstood something she said because she was originally got a not guilty verdict, which scared the (laughs) afflicted girls, either, either because they expected the devils to do something or because they did not want to be not believed. Uh, But they screech, and it seems like they're being heard. And Stoughton sends the jury out to reconsider. They come back and ask her about a certain statement she had made when she was brought into the room. One of the confessors had come in, and she said, why is she here? She's one of us. Did she mean one of us witches or one of us accused? which is what she meant. But she doesn't answer, and they figure, okay, she has nothing to say to, in her defense, and they bring back the guilty verdict. And her family tells her afterwards what had happened, and she writes, this, or she signs a statement that they wrote for her, or she wrote it herself, saying that she thought they meant a, a fellow prisoner, not a fellow witch. And all this is presented to the governor, and they get a reprieve. And whereupon there are even worse afflictions, and the reprieve is taken away, and she hangs. But they do try, and they keep trying. And they they, they never really... I don't know if they never forgive the accusers, but Paris and the Putnams certainly thought that Rebecca was a witch at the height of the panic there. And they are at obvious odds for a long time thereafter. And they're part of the faction that would like to get rid of Paris and break that contract for obvious reasons. You know, you look at everything that's kind of swirling around the village of Salem Mm -hmm. that's causing this to occur. In, In your book, specifically in The Six Women, you're really focusing on these women and their lives and... Right getting a view from inside. I'm trying to. Well, no, you, you are. Okay. And and why is it important to focus on these specific uh, women? Well, the uh, something biographical, trying to tell what it was like to go through it, what it was like to live through it as an accused or an accuser. It's, I mean, there are concepts and of what goes on in the world and these great movements of history, but how does it hit an individual? Depend, And there are different parts of society or, or different parts of the disaster that's going on. I was trying to get into, into their minds and see it through their eyes, but, you know, that's been 350 years now. <laughs> so I can only guess if I've done it. But I tried. Do you see any parallels in the lives of women in 2018? <laughs> some people are believed easier than others. And some people aren't believed, even when they're telling the truth. There's, there's a feeling that it is very silly, in, in some strange way, very silly, that anyone could believe mm-hmm. that the belief in witches was so pervasive that human beings could get hurt and actually go to court Hmm. for these things. There are um, nowadays it's this almost like what they believed in witches, but are, 
are there things nowadays um, in, in contemporary mm -hmm. times that could be considered similar uh, to a belief in something that mm. is just either not true or, or fantastical? Right. Well, the idea of, the, of witches or evil magic was not just the Puritans, not just New England. It was general in the colonies in Europe and in other cultures in North America, Africa, Asia, all over. The fact that it could happen was just obvious to them. Uh, and if people are afraid enough, they will have physical reactions. And people can be overreacting to things nowadays that could happen, such as the, there was a Satanist scare where daycare centers were supposedly being targeted. Well, there are crimes against children that are horrible, and they can happen, but that doesn't mean that they were happening in those cases or even that there were organizations of Satanists doing it. But, they were re but people reacted really strongly to it. Uh, obviously, there are toxic waste problems that can poison people, and big companies and industrial waste is a very real problem. But sometimes there are physical reactions now that could logically be explained that way, but there's no evidence there is any, which doesn't, which means presumably that there isn't a problem with toxic poisoning with those sufferers, but that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as toxic waste. <laughs> so even if you continue to believe that e evil magic is possible, and people do, and other cultures, and in this one, uh, the point then and now is, is that's what's happening here and now? Can you be certain? Don't panic yet. Try to figure out exactly what's going on. And if they've done that then, without changing their views or worldview or anything, it wouldn't have gotten so far, but the panic really exploded. And nowadays, it would explode over something else. And it wouldn't be just like the Salem problem, so it doesn't have the Halloween spookiness to it, and it's not recognized. I'd love to have a sense of what the life for Puritans living in Salem and in Essex County was like aside from the witch trial? Uh, well, let's see, most, well, most of New England was agrarian, and it depended on how, on the weather as to how good the crops were from year to year. 92 was a drought year, so that was another worry. In the center of Salem, down by the harbor part, most of the people were in the maritime trades and the merchants who had far-flung business associations, up and down New England and abroad, depending. I think Philip English had connections as far as Russia. It's something about the fur trade, I think. The maritime economy was threatened by the war that was going on with Canada, which is border wars, um, guerrilla raids, retaliations, and so on. So there's pirates. There's pirate pirates who rob from anybody. Pri privateers licensed by the French Canadian governments to prey on English shipping because neither country has a navy. Navy. Uh, New England licensed privateers such as John Alden who would prey on French shipping. If you go far enough out to sea, you could be taken by Barbary pirates and sold as a slave in Northern Africa. There's, the, as I say, the war at home, frontier raids, and a lot of the people had evacuated from some of the more remote main settlements and come south for safety's sake. A lot of the people in the Salem area had some connection or other with Maine and the attacks there. Others, people who were around, were veterans of the King Philip's War and had, had fought with the native peoples in southern New England. And some of the people were on militia duty up in May, down May, excuse me, uh, was protecting with the garrisons, had experience there. Some had gone in the fleet to Canada in 1690, I believe, when New York and New England were going to gang up on Canada 
make sure that wasn't a military threat anymore. And it was smallpox and storms ruined that idea. And some prisoners were exchanged, but it made for a terrible debt in the treasury. So that's a big problem. But uh, farming, crops, trade, fishing, they were all kind of at risk because of the weather and the economy and the war. So there were a lot of strains that way. But it's, it's not a mechanical society. It takes time to get from one place to another. It might, I don't know if it was quicker to sail to Boston from Salem, but it took the better part of a day to get there by horseback. And you'd have to cross a couple of ferry, with ferries to get across the rivers or go way around the marshes. I mean, the railroad goes right across it now <laughs> and the roads, but you had to go around things. And uh, getting word, well, they seem to communicate rather quicker than I would have thought with Maine. It may be a couple of days to get an answer as to have they burned down the garrison yet. Uh, and of sending a question to England, as Phipps did, took months. But besides the trip over by ship, it had to go through channels with the Privy Council, and then it didn't come back until May, which was, do what you think is best. <laughs> so, yeah, it, and something mechanical would be a mill, which would be quite high-tech, I guess, <laughs> grist mill, but they also had sawmills, especially in the Maine, New Hampshire area, where there'd be uh, vertical saws going up and down because the buzz saw hadn't been invented yet. And that was high tech, but stuff is done by hand, and traveling is by foot or by horseback or by boat. How important was firewood? Oh, very important. Yes, firewood would be the main fuel, if not the only one. It was important in this in the witch trials because one of the problems with the minister Samuel Paris is that the contract included firewood. His uh, supply for heat, cooking. And there was question as to whether it had been included. Did we really include the firewood or would, did we give you something extra to cover the firewood? He doesn't have enough trees of his own. He has to buy it. And it's not deep, dark, impenetrable forests. There's woodlots and fields. <laughs> uh, more, I don't know if there's more trees now or then, or then, but you don't just go cutting down a tree because it either belongs to the town or it belongs to somebody else. So at one point, he's really low on it and complaining about it. But that was just a bone of contention between the people who didn't support him and the people who did. But you did need it because the houses were not insulated. They maybe had, well, they'd put bricks b between the timber and the plaster, but that's not terribly warm. I think some houses were found to have eelgrass or something in between the walls. I don't, I'm not sure if that was later, but you had to be close to the fire. I mean, Cotton Mather lived in the city of Boston and had a good house, but he's writing in the winter and, his, and the ink freezes in the inkwell. <laughs> so it was a necessity. What was the function of the meeting house? Well, the meeting house is a Puritan concept. It's And also the fact that they're out in the, a new land where they have to build things from scratch in the first, first generation. A meeting house was an all-purpose building. They would meet there for civil meetings, selectmen, town meetings. But they would meet there for religious meetings also because that was the main reason a lot, most of them had come over in the first place. So it depends what time of the week it is as to what you're using it for. It's town-owned because they're pretty much all the same belief system. Uh, as the population expanded in various places where there were maybe Baptists and Quakers, they didn't want to have to support that. <laughs> and in Salem, there was a Quaker meeting house. They had their own. At this point, in Boston, the, uh, the meeting houses were owned by their congregations, not by the town. It, there were three congregational congregations in town, plus, at this point, an Anglican church, Quaker meeting house, and a Baptist church, too, and I think a Huguenot one, and they're all owned by their own 
people. So when the royal governor, Sir Edmund Andros, came and wanted a place for the Church of England people to worship, uh, they used the townhouse, which was a non-meeting house, non-religious meeting house, all civic meeting place. And that kind of went against the grain for a lot of people who weren't Church of England. So he kind of commandeered one of the churches, used it in the morning, old South Meeting House, he used it in the morning. And if they ran over, you just stood out in the rain and waited. <laughs> that really got people's backs up. And then they built King's Chapel. But th my point is, the town did not, the town did not own the meet, the religious structures in Boston because it was a bigger population. The individual towns generally had one because why pay for two different buildings if the same people are going to be using them for the different purposes? Salem Village, because of its geographic location, had their own meeting house finally, which took time to get permission for. And then there was the meeting house in the middle of Salem, and presumably geographically it was supported differently. But Salem was also big enough that they, at this time, had a townhouse that was up the street, opposite where City Hall is now, where they had the selectmen meetings and the town meetings. And the school, a Latin school, was on the ground floor, the courtrooms upstairs. I sometimes wonder if anyone got any lessons done that summer. And they kept the firefighting equipment in the attic, which would make it rather hard to get to in case of a blaze, but there was room. But they also did occasionally do, uh, have civil meetings in the meeting house because it was bigger. In 1692, one of the hearings is held there because some of the uh, uh, le legislature is coming up to observe the crisis and they need a big space. But for the most part, it was under repair in 92. I guess they had religious services there, but they they had the legal stuff going on in the townhouse up the street. What does school look like for hmm. an average kid growing up around that time? Well, it was a law after a while that you were supposed to teach your kids to read. More people, the literacy rate was good here in New England because it, it was seemed essential that you needed to read the Bible for yourself and see what it was and laws and stuff. More people could read than could write because reading was taught separately, unlike together with writing as now. It seems logical to teach them together, <laughs> but uh, people could read who could not write, and they would sign their name with an X. It didn't mean they were totally illiterate, because they'd also want to read those deeds and wills, too. <laughs> uh, that uh, The reading could be done at home. Sometimes someone's mother would do it. There were more women who could read than in some places. That would be a dame school, dame being the equivalent of sir, which was what schoolmasters would call because they had a bachelor's degree and that was comparable to a knight, which would be called sir. It gets complicated. Not that women had any degrees at all or could get into a higher university, but that's why they call dame schools. It, it was a more polite way to address people than like Dame Edith Evans, the actress who has the rank. Anyway, uh, if a town had, oh, so many families in it, they were supposed to have a grammar school, which meant Latin grammar, which would be the boys uh, learning Latin, maybe Greek. They might have already gone to a writing school. Uh, th that's to prepare you for college, the Latin and the Greek. So that... But just the boys. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think in Dedham, the, in the town records, I happen to be looking at Dedham, <laughs> uh, there was a question, do we teach the girls too? But apparently they didn't think they were going to invest in that. So they might learn reading and writing. If they're lucky, they learn some arithmetic too to keep accounts. There were private schools with a schoolmaster or somebody who would take on students if they got the Latin and Greek, the boys, then they could apply. If they 
were so inclined to the college, which is Harvard. They tend to generally call it the college. It's actually the only one in North America at the time, so they might as well. Uh, and that would be... They didn't want an ignorant ministry in the future because they were so far away from Oxford and Cambridge. And that's what it was mainly for, so that the light of learning would not go out. But not everybody was going to be a minister who went there. Some of the merchants were well-educated too, but some of the merchants, like Hawthorne, did not go to the college. But he he'd read things, I guess. Uh, it's hard to know what some... But his educational background was. Yeah. It may be hard for some younger listeners mm. hearing this to understand why women and girls, any females, were not taught the <laughs> same way that, <laughs> that males were taught. It, they may have a hard time understanding that. Right. Can you just talk to us about why, what the roles were, mm -hmm. what the perception was? Well, women's work was mostly in the household. And it took without mechanism. It took a long time to accomplish and keep a house running and clean. And they probably got a kitchen garden and the, the cow and stuff, which it's full-time work. So they didn't need, supposedly, to, to know these other things. The boys are probably, most of them are farmers and they're doing field work and taking care of other livestock and so on. So, and not most people didn't need, but they needed to be able to deal with deeds and wills or find someone reputable who'd write it down the way you wanted. So they maybe needed more of it being more out in the world. But lit literacy was important to them because they wanted to be able to read the Bible and other, other good books. So there was literacy. And certainly uh, there were some well-educated girls and women, but it would have been from home and learning outside of a, a regular schoolroom, which was aimed at boys and boys going to higher education would be colleges. It was a long time before women could get into colleges in the United States. And when I was in college, Harvard was still a boys' school. Briefly, if, if you could uh, describe what Puritan writing is like stylistically, because this is a gee. very di distinct style to me. Well, the the books and the, and the titles, they, they tended to have long titles that were more a description of what the book was going to be about. And depending on the edition, the printer would highlight parts of it more than others, so it looks like it has a different title almost. But uh, yeah, there would be long, sometimes flowery sentences. There were a lot of biblical allusions, which they'd give the references to what chapter and verse they were talking about. People were expected that they, everybody knew what that meant or could look it up. There were also classical allusions because the university education, they had read the classical writers from ancient Greece and Rome, pre-Christian stuff, which some critics said was dangerous pagan ideas being given these ministers. These are like Quakers and people who certainly weren't going to send their kids to college. Virgil, Cicero, Caesar, I mean, what do we need that for? But they were well versed in classical literature. So... There's a lot of allusions to that, too, and they might give the references to it, but, yeah. Uh, but uh, one, of the, one of the presidents of Harvard, and maybe Chauncey, was advice to young ministers. Uh, if you're trying to get an idea across, don't be too high-flown, he's saying. Don't shoot over their heads. They're not going to understand it, and then there's no point in saying it in the first place. Don't be so... Don't show off your learning, but be direct. What do people miss when they think about the Salem witch trials? What's the mm. one thing that maybe people miss still? I think people generally see the Salem witch trials as something so bizarre they can't really identify with it, that it's something foolish people did because they didn't know any better, they didn't have computers, they didn't have this, they didn't know that, and we're smarter than they are. But they were educated people and well-intentioned people who even by the lights of their own philosophy in their own time could have figured out that things were not proceeding as they should without converting to 21st century skepticism, for example. And people who mean well and are well-educated, 
and are general, genuinely concerned for, say, their children's welfare, nowadays can go off in the wrong direction. Also, even though their motives, assuming they're not lying about it, assu- their motives are good, I need to protect my children, I need to protect my family. But you can still go off the rails with it, and that's what happened then. I think for the most part, for the most part, people were convinced that something awful was happening, and then they just went the, down the wrong road for too long. People tend to think of it as spooky Halloween stuff, especially in October. But it was serious and deadly, and even if you didn't die, it really messed things up. And if people who were just on the periphery, it it messed up the economy and the in society. So bad things can happen, and they happen in different costumes each time. So you don't see it coming until you're in the middle of it. Were there any lasting effects, I guess in a more general sense, um, of the Salem witch trials that, that specifically affected women? Well, there certainly were no more witch trials. People didn't want to get near that embroglio again. Some people thought that it was stopped too soon, that really was something going on, that it was a (laughs) cover-up. But uh, generally it was one huge embarrassment to the government. There were slander suits brought by people who had had been accused, as had been done about before that, because uh, prior to 1692, I think about a third of the witchcraft which cases were slander suits where you were trying to clear your name, and they generally won. But I don't know. It, it certainly left a lot of neighborhood and interfamily resentments that lasted a couple of generations. But then you find people a couple of generations on marrying someone from the opposite camp. So it's. I don't think they're angry now. <laughs> It just makes for a very interesting genealogy. One of the fascinating things driving through Danvers versus mm-hmm. driving through Salem proper um, is just how the this period and the trials are treated just mm-hmm. in the public street. Yeah, well, because Danvers is a separate town now, it sort of was not remembered that that was where things started. And Salem's got this history that everybody knew about one way or another. I think the tourists came before the tourist industry. They responded to people's interest from what I've been able to figure out. Uh, And when the railroads came in and it was a lot more traveling, there was more of it, even though locals didn't want to talk about it necessarily. (laughs) Others were more interested in discussing it, but, you know, it was not, uh, it was not a shining example of community spirit. But uh, there was a newspaper article in 1892 when it was the 200th anniversary. And uh, the reporter was going through Salem and he's talking to the cab driver, which is a horse-drawn cab. And the cabbie says that there's two things that people who have a little time in Salem want to go see. They want to see the house where Hawthorne was born, the Nathaniel, and they want to see where the witches were burned or hanged or something like that. Hey, I guess he knew they were hanged, and he probably took them to the wrong place, but that's what people asked for, and in 90, 1892 was the year of the first souvenir silver witch logo spoon in Salem from the Daniel Lowe Company, which was quite a jeweler in town in the building that's now across from the cement, the Stevens Bewitched statue. <laughs> so things were starting up, and there was a there was an opportunity there people took advantage of. But when the mills and the, the leather industry and the textile mills went elsewhere, tourism filled a void too. But there was also more notice of Salem through TV and books and things. It kind of was an unstoppable force. And some of it's good. And some of it is very inaccurate. Arthur Miller's play, which is creative fiction, but definitely on the on the part about 
not being believed when you're telling the truth. So you lie and then they believe you. That's, that hits the nail on the head. That made it internationally known, so if it hadn't been before. People know about it all over the world. So that becomes Salem to them. And it's not just Salem, it's the whole area had problems. Salem was the Shire town, so that's where the court sat. But, well, because it's so well known, I, the most I hope for is that get the facts out and hope that people listen and aren't just satisfied with having a Halloween joke out of it. I like Halloween, but this is not that. Hey folks, it's Aaron here. I hope that today's interview helped deepen your understanding of everything involved in the Salem Witch Trials. But we're not done yet. We've got more interviews to share with you. So stick around after this brief sponsor break to hear a preview of next week's interview. Hi, I'm Jane Kamensky. I teach history at Harvard University, and I'm also the director of the Schlesinger Library on the history of women in the United States. I'm going to start us off with a really, well, deceptively simple question, but it's pretty complex, I'm sure. What was a witch in 1692? Um, a witch was somebody who made unexpected things happen. Um, Puritans lived in a world of portents and wonders and omens. They're always watching the sky. They're watching the earth. Um, they're, you know, uh, God speaks to them. And I think a witch was somebody who made omens and portents and signs happen in ways that um, seem to reside inappropriately in a human form. Mm. Uh, witches in Puritan New England were not thought to wear black pointy hats, although they sometimes did ride around on brooms. Um, and they acted in a whole manner of inappropriate ways or were present at times when inexplicable things happened. Mm. Um, Small harms, you know, milk curdling, sour uh, cider going sour, um, big harms, uh, you know, somebody saying, oh, what a pretty child that is, and the child soon sickens and dies. Um, women who spoke out of turn, uh, you know, who whose tongues went on like fishwives in ways that um, really seemed to sort of stick out of the fabric of conversation mm -hmm. at the time. Um, people who said things that later seemed to be ominous. Um, it's a world in which, you know, science is quite primitive and a great deal of what unfolds in any given season is inexplicable, right? Crops fail, animals die. Um, and sometimes in the search for supernatural explanations, um, which included God and the devil, um, which is as the handmaidens of the devil um, were, were faulted. It's hard to see looking backwards whether there were individuals who cultivated that reputation, um, who had uh, sort of family businesses in curative arts that flirted with the edge of uh, of the supernatural, you know, there there are some instances in Salem where um, uh, women are found with poppets that seem to be uh, little little cloth dolls that seem to be used in um, in some kind of ritual. One thing that's quite different in uh, in the early New England witchcraft cases than in uh, a lot of more ancient witchcraft cases is that Puritans are very concerned with the idea that some witches consort with the devil. Um, you know, there's a there's a black mass that surfaces in accounts of Salem that's not typical in run-of-the-mill witchcraft cases um, where it's where it's really more about livestock or about what we would now think of as a nightmare. I woke up with a sensation of somebody pressing on my chest and I thought mm. of my neighbor and it must have been her um, bewitching me. Um, so a whole range of unexpected happenings that didn't have an easy narrative cause that could fasten on somebody who for whatever reason um, 
stuck out in a fabric of society that was supposed to be smooth. Very. This episode of Unobscured was executive produced by me, Matt Frederick, and Alex Williams, with music by Chad Lawson and audio engineering by Alex Williams. The Unobscured website has everything you need to get the most out of the podcast. There's a resource library of maps, charts, and links to Salem document archives online, as well as a suggested reading list and a page with all of our historian biographies. And as always, thanks for supporting this show. If you love it, Head over to applepodcasts.com slash unobscured and leave a written review and a star rating. It makes a huge difference for the show's growth. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>